My name's Stan. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm excited to start this new series today because I do believe that growing people grow the church, and this series is all about you growing. But I got a question for you before we get started. What is your biggest pet peeve? We all have those things that we do that maybe annoy other people and things, and usually we're not really aware of it. It happens involuntarily. And that's actually what the definition of a habit is. A habit is a settled tendency or usual manner of behavior, an acquired mode of behavior that has become involuntary. We don't even know we did it, we, that we're doing it. Another definition of a habit is it's a behavior pattern acquired by frequent repetition that shows itself in regularity or increased facility of performance. When I read that last little bit about the performance, it's frequent repetition. And I think about basketball players, and I look at basketball players that are so amazing and they hit 90% of their free throws and all those things. But you know how many free throws they shot before they were hitting 90% of their free throws? Tens of thousands of free throws. Frequent repetition to get there. And now it's automatic. It just happens, right? You understand that, right? So not all habits are bad or annoying, and that's a good thing. We're starting this series today called Habits, Six Habits That Are Going to Grow Your Faith. And you are not going to want to miss any of these. I promise you. Online people, keep tuning in online. In the room people, keep coming back to the room but if you can't make every week, we do have you covered. You can go to the website, you can go to the YouTube channel, all those things, and you can catch up if you miss any. But don't miss any, because this is going to be an amazing series that's going to help you grow your faith. The goal of this series is to equip you with some tools that are necessary for growing your faith. So you may be thinking, why should I grow my faith? Why does my faith need to grow? And those are great questions. But I want to submit to you that living things grow, like plants, right? This is actually a live plant, and I think we've had it for a few years even. Yeah? Yeah. One, one year? Okay. That's why it's still alive. So <laughs> it's not just plants, though. Kids grow, right? And it's fun to watch kids grow. But what do they need to grow? They need watering. They need fertilizing. They need food. Kids, too, need all these things. They need attention. They need love. Sometimes they need intervention. But what happens when a living thing is neglected? When it does not get the water and the fertilizer and the care and the sunlight and all those things? I'm going to show you. This is what happens after we've had a plant for two years. <laughs> it's pretty sad, isn't it? Same home, same people caring for them, sort of, kind of. But uh, I reckon one got a little more attention because it's at our front walk and you walk past it all the time versus the one that was in the back garden just kind of out of the way and not doing anything. And it got neglected. It didn't get the food. It didn't get the water. It didn't get the fertilizer. Now, I would suggest to you that our faith can be a lot like these plants. They can be growing and flourishing. And by the way, this is growing, but it could be a whole lot better, right? right? If, you, if you're a plant person, you're looking, you brought that up as an example of a good plant, right? So, but it's striving to be, right? Okay. <laughs> Hasn't got there yet, but it's on its way. Thanks for that. Thanks for those polite claps. That's great. Um, but sometimes, if we neglect our faith, it can look like this. It can look like, yeah, it's still there, but some people would wonder, is it, is it alive at all? And I think it's probably not. But uh, um, anyway, our faith is a living thing, and it needs to be growing. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about faith. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Now, when you see that verse, faith is the evidence of the things, the reality of what we hope for. Is your hope greater today than it was when you started following Jesus? 
Is it greater today than when you were 10 years old? Probably. You got some life experience under you, and your faith has grown a little bit. But what about your faith in Jesus, your faith in God, and your trust in God? Has that grown? That's what we're talking about this morning is our faith growing. Our faith needs to grow. Jesus challenged his disciples on several occasions when they were struggling with their faith, and he said, you have little faith. Implication being your faith needs to grow. You need greater faith than what you have right now. Colossians chapter 2 says this, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. I want you to see a couple of things in this verse. I want you to see some movement in this verse. It says, just as you accepted Christ, that was a decision that you made. That was a moment in your life when you said yes to Jesus. It says, as your Lord, you must continue to follow. That moment needs to have some movement now. You have to continue to follow the Lord is what it says there. You know, Jesus called us not to just lead people to making decisions, but to make disciples. Many of us have just made a decision and we've got our relationship with God. It's there because we said a prayer and it's done. That decision and we're living on that, hanging on to that, and that's it. But Jesus said, I want you to make disciples. I want you to become disciples, not just decisions. First Peter chapter 2 says this. Like newborn babies, that's when you make a decision, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Friends, there are things beyond the decision as you're following Jesus. It's talking about the full experience of salvation where you can live in that and enjoy that and follow that more closely. And it says, like newborn babies cry out for nourishment. You know, ba babies are so cute. They're wonderful, aren't they? Aren't they wonderful? Right there, right, right up front. That's my granddaughter, so she's cute, of course. Got four of those and a grandson running around here somewhere. But, you know, when they're hungry and they can't really talk yet and can't express what they want, what do they do? They go, wah! Wah, wah, wah! Feed me, feed me, feed me! Well, Peter says, just like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow. So if, you're made a, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, but you haven't been growing, be like a baby. Start crying out saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, all right? And then we'll get on to that, all right? So if you want to do that, just start crying. And somebody will come over to you, and we'll make sure that you get what you need. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about this growth experience. It says, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Anybody ever been tricked and fooled, deceived? Is it fun? We don't like that, do we? Well, it says here in Ephesians, that, go back one, please. What did it say? It says that we won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth because we're not immature anymore. That's what growth is all about. And then it goes on to say, instead, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So we're talking about growing our faith. And this week, our first habit that we're going to investigate and unpack for you is this one. It's Bible reading. Bible reading. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fingers aren't quite working this morning. And you might think, why would I read the Bible? I'm going to give you a really simple answer, and the sermon can be over if everybody agrees, all right? God said so. So let's go do it. Sermon's over. Is that good enough for you? Of course not. No, they're skeptics. I can see it in your eyes. So, so we're going to move on. You know, when we talk about reading the Bible, there's a classic passage where, that was written by a guy named Paul, and he had a young disciple named Timothy, and he was trying to teach him what scripture was all about. And he said this to Timothy about scripture. He said, 
All scripture is inspired. God breathed is what that word means. It's literally the breath of God. Inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So reading the Bible has a purpose. Three things there. It teaches us what is right. It corrects what we've got wrong. And then it teaches us or trains our behavior. Teaches us what to do. How we can fix things. So that we grow into the person that God has called us to be. So when I read that verse, I realize the Bible, Scripture, is so powerful. If we look at just that one verse and we see the power that it has to teach us, to correct us, and to train us, it's a life manual. Why would we struggle to read the Bible? But how many of us struggle to read the Bible? And you don't have to raise your hand. I can see all those hands that aren't being raised, but you wanted to raise them. A lot of us struggle to read the Bible. And there's many reasons. Some people find it boring. Pastor Deanna said, as soon as you get to Leviticus, you're done, and things like that, if you started in Genesis. But I want to submit to you a couple of reasons that I think we struggle reading the Bible. One is we approach it wrongly. We approach it and we read the Bible like a rule book. We're looking to figure out what are the rules, where are the loopholes, right? How can I get out of that and everything? And certainly there are things in the Bible. There are commands in the Bible. There are things that are rules to live by. We had a series called Rules to Live By. You can go back and listen to that on the YouTube channel. But there's more than that. In fact... You have, if you started in Genesis, you have 50 chapters of Genesis and then 19 chapters of Exodus, that's over half of Exodus, before we get a list of rules, okay? Before that, it's all story. It's all narrative about people's lives and how they lived. And then when you, before you get to that list of rules, there was a few rules. There was a few commands that were interspersed. One was don't eat the fruit. And then it was build a boat. He told Noah, right? And then he said, Noah, get in the boat. Then he told Abraham, leave your land and go to a place I'm going to show you. That was pretty much it until we get past Exodus chapter 19. The rest of it is narrative and story. And friends, once you embrace it as story, the rules make a lot more sense then, all right? So if you've been using the Bible as a rule book, stop it, okay? It's not just a rule book. It's so much more. Sadly, Some people want to major on the rules. And churches have for decades and decades and centuries majored so much on the rules that it has become legalism and judgmentalism. If you talk to people who don't like the church, they'll say, we're judgmental, right? And it's all just a bunch of rules and things. And and those are reasons people don't like the church. And many, 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 many people have been hurt by churches that were focused on using the Bible as a rule book and beating people over the head with the rule book and being judgmental. And if that's you today, if you're one of those that's been hurt by churches doing that, I am sorry. I am sincerely sorry that happened to you. If you're listening online, you just stumbled across this and you haven't been to church in decades because you got hurt in the church, I am sorry. And I would ask you to give it another try. Find a place that's not using the Bible like a rule book. You know, the Bible has rules that are gonna help us in life, but it's not primarily a rule book. Another thing that we do with the Bible, if we're not treating it like a rule book, we use the Bible for memes and coffee mugs. All right, we'll take a Bible verse out of context and use it to get warm, fuzzy feelings or inspiration from, right? How many of you have these coffee mugs, right? Or you're on your Facebook wall. I'm gonna check all your Facebook accounts and see if you're putting these things up there. Well, one of the reasons we do that is there was a guy called Stephanophus, Stephanus. And in 1551, he added verse divisions in the Bible. Before that, it was all just story. You're just reading the narrative. But he thought, man, it, it, it's awful hard to tell people, you know that bit in Galatians that says this, you know? So he put numbers in. And that makes it really convenient for us to look up things. I'm very thankful for, for that guy because it is helpful. 
to find things. But it makes us read the Bible more like little quips and sayings rather than a narrative of a story. You know, no one puts on a coffee mug, Judas went out and hung himself. Right? That's a Bible verse, right? And no one puts this on a meme. You fool, you will die this very night. <laughs> Luke chapter 12, verse 20. Why do we not do that? No. We put verses that make us feel better, inspire us, and, and things. And I'm about to pick on some of your favorite verse, some of yours fa- favorite verse. And I'm very sorry about that already, but I'm going to do it anyway. Some of us, we see Jeremiah 29, 11. I think that's the biggest culprit for, for that, uh, for the memes and stuff and the t-shirts and all that. And it says this, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Praise God, right? Yeah. Well, that was written to a specific people in specific circumstances in a specific place at a specific time. It was the nation of Israel in the Babylonian captivity. So, Jeremiah 29, 11 is all about you. Well, remind me again about your time in the Babylonian exile. Right? Right? So, friends, we misuse Scripture when we do that. And the problem with this is that we claim promises and blessings that were specific for someone else in their situation at their time, and we claim that for ourselves. And that becomes dangerous because it ignores the fact that many other people who have tried to claim those verses for decades and centuries haven't experienced that. And you know what happens then? They get disillusioned, they get dis- discouraged, they get disappointed, and their faith often gets shipwrecked because that didn't happen for me. It wasn't meant for you. Now, before you think that, oh, no, I've got to go burn all my memes or posters or whatever it is, principally, God is loving, faithful, kind, and he is going to care for us, and he has got great plans for us, but they're not to take us out of the Babylonian captivity. So don't use the Bible that way. So when we talk about reading the Bible, don't use it as a rule book. Don't use it to get the warm, fuzzy feels. Approach it from the context of it's an overarching story. And then see how that all fits together. So what are the benefits of reading the Bible? I'm going to give you a few benefits this morning of reading the Bible. John chapter 17 says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. So the first thing that reading the Bible does for you and for me is it grounds us in truth. It grounds us in truth. See, in our world today, truth is seen as relative. My truth and your truth are just as good as each other, even if they're diametrically opposed to each other, right? Even if they do not make sense working together, well, you can have your truth, I can have my truth, and that's okay. The one place to go to to be sure that it's true is God. God's word is truth, John 17 says. So if society has formed opinions and standards that disagree with God's truth, guess who we side with? Society, right? No, God's truth. I'm going to get scary here. If science disagrees with God's truth, Who do we go with? God's truth. Because often, we just misunderstand the science or we misunderstand God's truth if those aren't aligned. They can't both be right all the time. Some truths that we know about God from his word are these. God is the creator and sustainer of the universe. We are not just some random thing that happened. He created us and he sustains us. God is faithful and God is true. God is holy and he's righteous. God is loving, God is kind, God is generous. Those are all truths that God teaches us about himself in his word. So if you ever doubt any of those things, get into the word and you will find those things and you can trust those things. God will also judge the world one day. That's a truth, whether we like it or not. 
But you know a beautiful thing that's a corollary to that? God is a forgiver. God is forgiving because he doesn't want us to be a part of that judgment. He wants us to come to him and seek his forgiveness. And see, as we embrace God's truth, John 17 says it makes us holy. Holy means separated, set apart. It makes us different. It makes us weird by the world standards. And the way that happens, the reason that happens is because as we are exposed to God's truth and we learn more about who he is and we're trying to follow him, it's going to affect the way we behave because what we believe affects how we behave. So friends, God's word grounds us in truth, but it doesn't stop there. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 9 says, how can a young person stay pure by obeying your word? I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the Bible not only grounds us in truth, but it guards us from sin. The Bible guards us from sin. When we do the wrong thing and we know it, what happens? We feel guilt. We feel shame and all those things. Anybody else or is your conscience so seared and dead that it doesn't matter, right? The Bible guards us from sin. God's work can keep us from doing the wrong thing because when we love God and we're pursuing him, we want to obey God's word. Not because we have to, but because we want to. See, Jesus knew the power of God's word and when Satan took him out into the wilderness in Matthew chapter four, and you can read this whole context for yourself another time, in Matthew chapter four, verse four, it says, Jesus told him, talking to Satan who was tempting him, no, the scripture says people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus used God's word to resist temptation, to take on the devil when the devil was trying to tempt him. He says, no, 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 no. We live by the word of God, not by bread alone. Another way the Bible helps us to deal with sin Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, says the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So it not only protects us from our own tendency towards sin, when we do sin and you will sin, I will sin, it exposes it so that we can deal with it. The word of God is active, it's alive, it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is also our only offensive weapon in our battle against Satan. In Ephesians chapter six, it says that we uh, have the armor of God and there's lots of pieces of armor that it talks about, but in verse 11 it says, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Then in verse 17, he says, put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Every other piece of armor that it talks about in Ephesians 6 is defensive. The only offensive weapon we have against Satan is God's word. That's why it's so important as we are battling against Satan and against his uh, demons and everything, uh, and you don't see this physically most of the time, but that war is going on, the only thing you have, your sword, is the word of God. So it's important to know the word of God. It grounds us, it guards us. Look at Psalm 119, 105. It says, your word is a, la a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. The Bible guides us along our path. It guides us. Anyone need some guidance? You know, there's a whole industry that's built around that. It's called coaching. And that wasn't a thing when I was young. But now everybody and their dog is a coach. And the cats have coaches. We need guidance. I'm so glad that my kids are grown and gone because if I get up in the middle of the night and I'm walking through the house, I don't step on Legos. <laughs> yeah. Although I do have grandkids, and sometimes those toys do get still left out. But, uh, but, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have some light there when you're stumbling around in the dark and you step on something and it's not comfortable, it's painful? God's Word helps us discover our next step 
in life. It guides our path. It's like a light that guides that next step so that we can see where we're going and it can highlight where we need to be going. If you ever wonder, what should I do? Or if you're ever stuck saying, I got no idea what to do. There was a guy named Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament that said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We need the guidance of God's word when we don't know what to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, tells us something else that the Word of God does for us. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So here we see that God's Word, the Bible, grows us. It transforms us by changing us. We are all changing all the time. None of, even those that don't like change, you're changing whether you like it or not. We are all being influenced. We're being influenced by culture continually, changing the way we dress and the way that we look and the way we cut our hair, the mullet's back. Actually, I think it's on its way out again already and something else is there. We are influenced. The Apostle Paul is telling the Romans here, don't be influenced by the world around you. Be influenced by God. Let him change the way you think. The way that's going to happen is when you and I spend time getting to know him more and more, spending time in his word. I love the way Psalm chapter 1 puts it. It says, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees being planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Reading the Bible makes us fruitful and prosperous. That's what it says in Psalm 1 right there. But that's not all that reading the Bible does for us. Reading the Bible, according to Romans chapter 15, verse 4, says this. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scripture gives us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. So the Bible gives us hope. If you're struggling with hope, get in God's word. It gives you hope. You know, when life's not going as planned, we can have hope because we can see in Scripture that it's not finished yet. Your life's not finished yet, and the end of the world is not here yet. Anyone need patience while we're waiting for God to show up? My hand's up. Many days I need patience. I'm like, where are you, God? Look at the world. Help. But I know by reading God's word that it ain't done yet. And when it's done, God wins. We win. We're on the winning side. See, the story is still playing out in our lives now and for eternity. So what? What does all of this mean? Well, I hope today you've understood and accepted a little bit of the truth that you need to have your faith growing, not withered up and dead, right, for starters. Hopefully, you want to look more like this than like that, okay? Can we vote for that now? Raise your hand. Yep. Okay, thanks. My prayer this week is that you would embrace how important it is to be in the Word of God, to have a habit of daily Bible reading in your life because it grounds us in the truth, it guards us from sin, it guides our path, it grows by changing us, and it gives us hope. That should be enough, without me saying anything else, for you to want to run out and start reading your Bible, right? But there's more. The Bible changes us if we let it. See, there's one more step. You got a lot of information this morning about why you should read the Bible. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. So friends, don't just listen to this message. Get up and do something. And look at all these people getting up and doing something right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just guessing they may be standing behind me in a couple of minutes. You know, habits form who we are. Our identity in a large part is dictated by the habits that we develop in our lives. And I want you to approach daily Bible reading in a different way than you might think. Right now, if, if you're not a daily Bible reader, and I said, 
Who, who would try to do this this week? Most of you would stick your hands up. I, I'll try to do that. I'm a person who is trying to read the Bible. I want you to flip it. And I want you to say, I am a person who reads the Bible. Okay? Because you're going to establish that habit. And when you do it one time, guess what? You're a person who reads the Bible. And then the next day, you do it again. I'm a person who reads the Bible. The third day, you do it again. I'm a person who reads the Bible. The fourth day, you don't. Are you a person who doesn't read the Bible? No. You're a person who missed a day, but you're still a person who reads the Bible. So think about habits in that way and, and frame them that way for your own uh, consistency with it to, to help you frame it so that you don't get discouraged. Habits start with a step. They're the result of repeated actions. And my challenge for you this week is to spend 10 minutes every day reading the Bible. Some of you already do that. Some of you are like, I've got that down pat. I'm going to invite you to join in what I'm asking everybody else to do as well so we can all do it together, okay? And I want you to spend 10 minutes reading the Bible. We have a tool that we've been using for a few years called the Seeking Jesus Together Quiet Time Tool. And we've modified that for this series because a lot of people aren't doing it and we want to invite everyone to join. So this week you came in and you had on your seats a little paper, right? If you didn't have a paper, see the welcome desk out there when you leave and make sure you get one of these. It says six habits to grow your faith week one. And I would ask you to give this a try this week. And then next week, there's going to be another one. And guess what it's going to say on the front? Week two. two. And it's going to have some other verses for you to read through the week. And week three and week four and week five and six. By the time you're done, if you take this challenge, you will have done a quiet time or had the opportunity to do a daily quiet time 42 times. That will go a long way to you establishing this as a habit. Some people say it takes 21 days to, to, do a ha- or to make a habit. That's actually a myth, I, I understand. It takes somewhere between 18 and 254, um, depending on who you are, I guess. But 42 days. Just start, though, this week, next seven days, doing a quiet time. And here's how you do it. How does it work? Choose a time that is quiet and a place that is comfortable. 3 a.m. might have to be your time if you've got little kids and things. But choose a time that works for you. I do mine in the morning. I have to or else because so as soon as I start my day, I am flat out until I sit down and fall asleep by, uh, involuntarily because I'm so tired. But choose what time works for you. Maybe you're not a morning person. Maybe you're better at night. And then find a comfortable place. And here, here's another a tip, a pro tip. It's called stacking, habit stacking. Choose something else that you already do every day. If you're a breakfast person, maybe when you need to do breakfast, do the Bible too. I had a friend who uh, made it a rule for himself. He says, no, no breakfast or no Bible, no breakfast. You know, do you brush your teeth every day? Maybe you stack that habit with it. I hope you brush your teeth every day. Coffee, whatever it is that you do. Add, hey, when I do that, that's going to be the trigger for me to do a quiet time. Then sit down with your Bible or your app. By the way, it's on the app as well, and the verses are on the app. You can do it all within the app if you want to. I'm a paper and pen kind of guy. But sit down with that. Then read the passage for the day. Tomorrow, Psalm 119, 1 through 8. You read all those verses. And then simply write down what you think the writer was saying in your own words. You're rewriting the verses in your own words. What's going on here? And then reflect, meditate, and discern, consider what do those verses mean for me? What is God saying to me? What is the Holy Spirit saying to me right now today? And then write that down. Then... You've got a section in there for prayer. Just write a short prayer. Maybe it's a prayer based on the quiet time, or maybe it's just the things that are on your heart, some dot prayer dot points. And then I would encourage you, and it doesn't say this in in your quiet time, but share it with someone else if you can. If you live with someone else, say, hey, this is what God was saying to me today. And share that together. And then watch what God does throughout the day and see how it affects your life. Last week, You were given a challenge about growing in maturity, ministry, and making disciples. And many of you stood and said, I want to grow in maturity. This could be your next step. Because if the Word of God gets in you, then it's going to change you. 
It's going to ground you. It's going to guide you. It's going to guard you. It's going to grow you, and it's going to give you hope. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time that we've had to look into it and to understand how it can help us in our daily life, how even in 2023, this book that is thousands of years old, written by at least 40 different authors, is still relevant for our lives today. Lord, help us as we try to, uh, for those that have never established this as a daily habit, I pray for them right now that you would help them to take that step and that it would become something that they actually enjoy doing. And Lord, that you would help all of us to join in and do this together and see how it might relate to us as a church, as a whole church doing this together, what you might be saying and speaking to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for its power. Thank you that it is living. And Lord, help us to use it appropriately to grow our faith in Jesus' name. Amen.